the Vanguard Podcast. I'm Gavin. And I'm Zach. And we've just been joined by Mark Charles, author and independent candidate for President of the United States. In 2016, Donald Trump won the election by promising to make America great again. Not to be outdone, Hillary Clinton responded by telling her supporters that America's great already. You see, they both had a broad base of agreement. They both agreed our past, our history, which included the slavery of African people and the ethnic cleansing of native peoples. They both agreed our foundations, which excluded women and counted people of color as not fully human. They both agreed these things were great. They disagreed if we were great in 2016. Donald said no and Hillary said yes. You see, we were duped. We were led to believe this election was about racism versus anti-racism, equality versus inequality, but it wasn't. What we were actually deciding as a nation was, did we want Donald Trump to make us explicitly white supremacist, racist, and sexist again? Or did we want Hillary Clinton to work to keep our white supremacy and racism implicit? We the people has never meant all the people. How's it going, Mark? It's going well. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to uh, hear about your unique ideas and philosophy and the uh, campaign you're running for president. Uh, you know, most American voters and certainly our mainstream media are happy, more than content to think within the binary terms of Democrat, Republican, and pretty much, you know, prescribe issues based on those two uh, parties and their doctrines, uh, what they deem acceptable. But independent candidates such as yourself really dare to step outside of that political mainstream, which uh, it can create, you know, confusion for a lot of voters. And like I said, certainly the media, which doesn't do anyone any help to decode uh, people's, you know, unique beliefs or political philosophies. I thought a good question to start would just be, how would you describe your political ideology or philosophy? And how do you pitch your ideas to voters? Yeah, well, before we get into that, let me just introduce myself a moment. Sure. So uh, I'll, I like to do that traditionally. So Yate, Mark Charles, Yanishia, Tsin Bakay Dinet initially, Dotoy Haglini Bashishin, in our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people with our identities come from our mother's mother. So my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say, loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my mother's father, is also is also um, uh, is Tohiglini, sorry, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Dene. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also just want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you from Washington, D.C., and these are the lands traditionally of the Piscataway. And uh, the Piscataway are the nation that were here long before Columbus got lost at sea. They lived here, they farmed here, they fished here, they raised their families here, they buried their dead here. These were their lands. They're the host people of these lands and they're still here. Um, and so I want to acknowledge and honor the Piscataway people. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to acknowledge how humbled I am to live on their lands. Uh, the question you asked about just my kind of political identity, I've never really fit in well to either the Democrat or the Republican parties. I think I was raised in a household that primarily voted Republican. Um, and then when I got to college, my first election, I think I actually voted for Ross Perot, who ran as an independent um, uh, when I was in college. That was in 1992. And uh, after that, uh, through college and even beyond that, I, I tended to lean a bit more left in my policies and my thinking, but didn't really fit in perfectly well with the left. And especially as I began getting more into activism work and especially looking at the foundations of our country and studying about the doctrine of discovery, I realized I really didn't have a home in either party. When I began thinking more about becoming engaged politically, um, I wanted to uh, as, especially as I thought about even running for president, I wanted to make sure that when I ran, I would have an opportunity to win. And I want, but I also wanted to be very adamant I wasn't going to be seen as a protest candidate. Mm. So I was very intrigued when Bernie Sanders ran in 2016. And of course, he was a lifelong independent, and yet he ran as, as a Democrat. Now, anyone who knew anything about politics in 2016 knew that year was Hillary Clinton's year, right? She had sat out um, the second term of President Obama um, when he ran for office so he could run unopposed. It was, it was her year, anyone who knew anything about politics. And Bernie Sanders had to have understood that. 
but he wanted to talk about systemic economic inequality. And so he ran as a Democrat, knowing full well that it was going to be Hillary's year. And I think he got more traction, especially from millennials, than he was expecting. And that momentum was propelling him more to the forefront of that race. But of course, it was Hillary's year. He wasn't going to really get anywhere. Um, and so it was a long fight, but he ended up losing to Hillary, of course. And, but he started a movement. He actually got people interested. He brought new voters into the, into the picture. Um, and so he started a movement. And then he ran for the Senate in 2018 again for re-election, but he ran again as an independent. And then in 2020, he tried again to run as a Democrat. Again, understanding that the Democrats weren't really open to his idea, not, not the, the young voters he brought into the Democrats, the establishment the white landowning males who really run the Democratic Party. And so watching him in 2016 and knowing that the issues I was trying to raise to the forefront were even more systemic and more foundational than the inequality economics that he was looking at, I was looking at the very foundations of our nation with the white supremacy, the racism and the sexism. And I knew that the Democrats were never going to nominate me, not only because of how foundational these policies were, but because I was a person of color. I was a native running on native issues. And I knew that the Democratic Party was never going to nominate me. And so running as an independent was probably is the hardest way to get to the White House. But it's the only way that ever actually gave me a chance of getting there. If I wanted to just raise my issue and be a protest candidate, I would have run as a Democrat. I could have raised a lot more money. I could have brought a lot more attention to my cause. But like every other person of color, I would have been exiting the debate stage late 2019 and exiting the primary early 2020. Just like happened with Kamala Harris, just like with Cory Booker, just like happened with Kulio. You know, that, that's what would have been the case with my campaign. And I wanted to actually be president. And so I ran as an independent. Yes, I raised less money. Yes, less people are aware of my campaign. But it's now September of 2020 and I'm still in the race. I'm still here. And I have a much greater chance of being president right now than Cory Booker does, than Julian Castro does, than even um, Andrew Yang does. Are you on the ballot? Yes, my chances are slim, but I'm still in the race. And this is the opportunity I wanted. I wanted a chance to run against the nominees from the Democrats and the Republicans. Just to and clarify, so are you on the ballot in a, a majority of states? I am a write-in candidate. I'll okay. be a write-in candidate in most states. I'm on the ballot in the state of Colorado. Okay. Um, we had a ballot access plan for getting on the state. And of course, getting on the ballot is one of the most challenging things because of the signature collection. Due to the pandemic, and we shut down our in-person campaigning very early on and decided we weren't going to do any in-person campaigning, including getting signature collection. Um, there were a few states that allowed us to, to collect signatures remotely, but most states didn't allow that option. And so we decided to, be, to work to be a writing candidate in most states around the country. So uh, we, we are working very hard on our writing, on our writing campaign, and uh, we're collecting electors in a lot of states. This week, we're working on California, Tennessee, and Arizona. And if we get those three states, we will have access to 273 total votes in the Electoral College, which um, is more than we need to get elected. And we still have about another 100 votes in the Electoral College that we, have to, we can gain access to even beyond that. So we are very much our viable campaign running all the way through November 3rd. Uh, as a candidate, you know, who's going to be relying on, on write-ins and, and, and potentially, you know, mail-in voting this election as a result of the pandemic and, you know, Donald Trump seemingly dead set on using his political power to ensure that the post office is unable to process votes in a timely manner and in this, an, an adequate way uh, to ensure that they're counted. Um, your campaign has vowed, uh, you know, to declare Election Day a national holiday and establish universal vote by mail. I'm wondering uh, if you have any concerns about the, uh, you know, uh, fairness of this election and impeding the ability of voters to vote by mail and, you know, uh, seeing voter suppression in a way that is, you know, exceeds what we always see in this country uh, come election time. 
Yeah, elections in the United States aren't fair. I mean, that's, that's a given, and that goes back 250 years. Even if you go back to the Electoral College, the, the purpose of the Electoral College is to maximize the influence of the white landowning male and to minimize the participation of people of color and women. That's why we have an Electoral College. So, of course, gerrymandering is going to be legal because the whole purpose of our voting system was to minimize the voice of the marginalized and to maximize the voice of the white landowning male at the center. One of the most freeing days of my life as a U.S. citizen was the day I acknowledged the Constitution wasn't written to protect me. We don't have a constitution to protect people of color, to protect women, to protect members, to protect members of LGBTQIA, 2S+. That's not why we have a constitution. We have a constitution to protect white landowning men. And so once I acknowledged that, it allowed me to, to understand the, uh, the, I guess I would say the unfairness of the system and then to make efforts to try and change that. So this is why there was a lot of options throughout this whole course of this election to join lawsuits and to, and to um, you know, try to get on the ballot or to raise issues of why certain states' um, uh, ballot access laws were not, were not fair, were not equitable. We had options to join a lot of those lawsuits. But again, the purpose of the Constitution is not about equality. This is the whole purpose of my campaign. And so I acknowledge that those systems are not fair to begin with. And the way I'm trying to change those systems is not by going to court, but by actually getting into office and working on the foundations. So, you know, the funny thing about, about democracy in our two party system and the two party system is absolutely set up to maintain the status quo. And the status quo is racism, sexism, and white supremacy. And so you have the, the Republicans who are terrified of voters, right? This is why Donald Trump is, is terrified of mail-in balloting. This is why they're working hard to, to make sure the post office doesn't, isn't able to, to, do, to deliver the mail properly. This is why he's raising so much fear, right? The Republicans are terrified of voters, but the Democrats are terrified of competition. They are afraid of anyone else running and they are working very hard to shame and even legally remove as many candidates as they possibly can from the presidential campaign. They don't want, they, they know that they've nominated one of the least inspiring candidates they had in their entire primary um, system. Even Jill, Joe's wife, acknowledged that he was not nearly as good on issues as, as the other candidates were, but they wanted people to vote for him anyway, because he was the most white landowning male from the 1% of the entire group. And of course, that's who the system was going to nominate. So yes, the, the Republicans are afraid of voters, but the Democrats are afraid of competition or of other candidates. And they both work very hard to suppress those two so that we can keep voters really not worrying about who's going to be the best candidate, who has the best vision, but really looking at what we're at now, which is which is going to be the lesser of two evils. And both systems are really about maintaining the status quo. Yeah. yeah. You've written about the uh, doctrine of discovery and, and spoken about it. Um, you, you mentioned it on this podcast, essentially this, you know, preposterous propaganda peddled in our schools that Christopher Columbus discovered a country that was already inhabited for, you know, hundreds of years and, and uh, by um, other people. It's, it's, it's this, you know, ludicrous if you say it like that, but yet our entire, you know, mythology as a country is based on this tremendous preposterous lie. Uh, you know, that it, it, it points to the extreme racial biases that, you know, underpin every system that is in this country. Uh, I just wondered if you could speak to how we unravel uh, such obvious cognitive blockades that have been built in, in the people's minds and, and how we work to unravel the systems that have come with them. Yeah, so most, most people are not aware of what the doctrine of discovery is. So the, the 32nd elevator version of what it is, is it's a series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic Church written between 1452 and 1493. It's the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman, their land is yours to take. This is the doctrine that allowed European nations to enslave people from Africa, as well as discover lands here in, in Turtle Island, North America. 
again, as you just said, you can't discover lands already inhabited. You can conquer those lands, you can steal those lands, you can colonize those lands. You can't discover them unless you believe the people live there are not human. Now that mindset gets embedded into the foundations of the nation. The Declaration of Independence, 30 lines after the statement, all men are equal, refers to natives as savages. The constitution keeps slavery legal in prison, never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. These are the foundations we have as a nation that center white landowning men and marginalize everybody else. And so one of the, one of the primary planks of my platform is I want to remove the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy from our constitution. On my campaign website at markcharles2020.com, on our blog, there is an article I put up there, a, a, a blog post I put up a few months ago. Probably about five or six years ago, I decided to read the Constitution as an adult. I had read it in school. I'd never read it as an adult, and I decided to read it, and I started going through it, and I was appalled at what I read. The entire constitution, I actually began, began counting as I went through it. There are 51 gender specific male pronouns, 51 he, him, and his, who can run for office, who can hold office, who's protected by the document. We've never abolished slavery. We exclude natives, we exclude women. We count Africans as three fifths of a person. The document is filled with racist, sexist, and white supremacist language from the, from the uh, preamble all the way down to the 27th Amendment. So I decided to edit it. I went through it, I downloaded it to my computer and went through it with a strikethrough font. Every time I came across a gender specific male pronoun, he, him, or his, I put a strikethrough font through it and replaced it with a gender neutral pronoun or a proper noun. The clause in the 13th Amendment that keeps slavery legal in prison, I put a strikethrough font through that clause. The sections that specifically exclude women or specifically exclude natives, I put a strike through font through those things. I didn't change the balance of power. I didn't change checks and balances. I merely removed the racist, the sexist, and the white supremacist language. And I actually made our constitution say what most people believe it says already. And so my plan is immediately after my inauguration to have someone present this as a bill into our legislator, the House or the Senate, and to have it passed as a correction to our constitution, and then have it sent out to the states to be ratified. Again, these aren't radical changes. All it's doing is removing the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy. I tell people all the time, if you think our constitution advocates for equality and justice and, and fairness, read the document out loud, get on a Zoom call, preferably with some natives, some African Americans and some women, and read the document out, out loud. You'll be appalled at how exclusive it is, how racist, how sexist, how white supremacist it is. And I'm saying, let's just remove that language so we actually have a basis for our laws that is inclusive of everybody instead of exclusive of everybody. Yeah, I think it's a great idea and well said. Um, another question I had was just on a, on a more uh, policy level, you know, the, the discussion of reparations has been brought up recently uh, in, the, in the Democratic primary. The subject was broached by the likes of Marianne Williamson, who made a great case for the policy. And, uh, but however, reparations are usually framed and discussed within the context of addressing America's history with slavery and repairing the, the wound between white and black communities. Uh, reparations are less discussed in the context of native communities and our country's long history of you know, breaking treaties with native communities and oppressing the indigenous peoples. Um, how would you envision an adequate government response to address the needs of native communities and help repair our history of displacement and ethnic cleansing in a way that would actually, you know, address the people's need and get help to those who need it in the disenfranchised communities of our country? Yeah, so... In regards to reparations for slavery, I absolutely believe that reparations are owed. Labor was stolen, people were dehumanized, and reparations need to be paid. One of the things I've been advocating since the beginning of my campaign is when you file a class action lawsuit, right, and you're a part of a lawsuit, and normally those lawsuits never go to court, they get settled out of court, 
and you've been part of that class action lawsuit, in order to go claim your, your piece of whatever the, the was won in the settlement, you normally have to sign a paper saying that you are now putting this legal matter to rest and you are waiving a right to sue over this issue again. This is how class action lawsuits work almost 90% of the time, especially when they're regarding large corporations and huge amounts of people and, and very uh, raw injustice. And so what I've been trying to say to the African American community within our country, I absolutely agree reparations are due and they need to be paid. But because the 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery, it just redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. What it says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, wherever the party has been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. We've never abolished slavery. This is one of the reasons why these lynchings and murders like George Floyd or these shootings like Jacob Blake happen is because the Constitution systemically protects slavery within our Constitution. It institutionalizes white supremacy within our criminal justice system. And so what I've been advocating for is if the African American community allows the United States government to pay reparations before it actually abolishes slavery, I can almost promise you slavery will never be abolished, right? Just like when you, when you settle class action lawsuit, if you want the payment, you have to promise to never sue over this issue again, and the US government will do everything they can to put this matter to rest. And so I'm advocating that let's abolish slavery. Let's actually get rid of the injustice and then immediately, or even in conjunction with that, let's talk about what do we need to do to right this wrong. Now, that is one of the, that is the African-American, that's, I'm not gonna put everyone into one group, but there are many people within the African-American community who are advocating for reparations, and it is their right, and I believe they are owed. The Native community has a much different issue. You can almost, and they try to quantify the injustice against um, African-American people. And they can almost begin to quantify the labor that was stolen. They don't even attempt to quantify the dehumanization and the oppression that was enacted against African people who were brought here and enslaved. But for native peoples, the number, the injustice is almost unquantifiable. When you look at the ethnic cleansing, the genocide, the stolen treaties, the stolen land, it is almost unquantifiable. I love what happened with the, with the Lakota people in South Dakota, where the US government stole one of their sacred mountains, Mount Rushmore, and they carved the faces of some of their most white supremacists and genocidal presidents into those mountains. Later they felt bad and they went back and they said to the Lakota people, we would like to pay for these mountains. And they offered money. And the Lakota people said they're not for sale. There is literally about a billion dollars sitting in a trust fund right now that the Lakota people refuse to touch because they refuse to sell these mountains to the United States of America. One of the things that so many native nations are fighting for is a nation to nation relationship with the US government, is sovereignty over their own lands. Just last week, as you stated earlier, not last week, last month, as you stated earlier, the United States government has been breaking treaties with native nations for its entire existence. In the Supreme Court case just a month and a half ago, McGirt versus the state of Oklahoma, which many people saw as a win for McGirt and for the Creek Nation, because they were arguing, had, had the, the eastern half of Oklahoma been disestablished as reservation lands, and the, the lower courts ruled that they had, and the Supreme Court reversed the ruling and ruled in favor of the Creek Nation and McGirt and said, no, the state of Oklahoma cannot disestablish reservation lands. 
The courts cannot disestablish reservation lands. And just because white settlement moved in, that does not disestablish reservation lands. So they reversed the ruling and said the eastern half of Oklahoma essentially is still reservation land, at least for judicial purposes of what needs to happen in court. However, they repeated numerous times, and it was Neil Gorsuch, who is one of the leading experts on American Indian law on the Supreme Court, and he wrote that opinion. And with the majority opinion, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg signed off on it. And throughout that opinion, probably six or seven times, the Supreme Court stated and restated that any time the United States Congress decides, and they actually said can muster the will, it has the right to disestablish reservation lands and break treaties with Native nations, and there's nothing anyone can do to hold them accountable about that. Even the Supreme Court will not hold them accountable. It was the first time, and while we know the government has broken treaties throughout its past, this is the first time I've actually read that the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Congress has the right to break treaties. Even though the Constitution says treaties are the supreme law of the land, the Supreme Court ruled that the U.S. Congress has the right to break treaties and there's nothing anyone can do to hold them accountable for it. This is one of the issues of, of what so many Native nations are advocating for and fighting for, which is they want to have a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship. They want to have sovereignty over their own land, or at least what Europeans call sovereignty. They want to be able to actually make decisions about the lands that they had or that they reside on now that they have treaties for. And so it, when you talk reparations with Native peoples, you, you, it, what it tries to do is it tries to frame the injustice as something that happened in an isolated moment in the past that can now be corrected through a payment, mm -hmm. which is not true. It's an ongoing thing that to this day, to six weeks ago, the Supreme Court stated that essentially before the US Congress, Native nations have absolutely no rights. And that issue needs to be dealt with much differently. And that's, I think, what many Native nations are, are going to be advocating for and working towards. And this is why, as a candidate for president, one of the things I'm advocating for is I am actually interested in going back and revisiting the treaties that were signed. And let's actually keep the word. If the U.S. government signed these treaties, Let's keep our word and honor our treaty obligations. Let's work to make these things just and enforceable rather than just ignore them because we feel we have the right to. Yeah, uh, I think I, I absolutely. Um, you know, one of the questions I had for you is the, about, you know, uh, if you were to become president, you would become the commander in chief of the most powerful and the most devastating military in human history. Um, you know, obviously, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are among the least palatable people to be put in uh, in charge of such a, a position. And I just wondered, uh, if you were to take office, how would you wield the Leviathan of the American military? And, and how would that differ from the hawkish tendencies of someone like Joe Biden or Trump? Yeah, so we've had a lot of discussion over the past few months, especially national discussion about the systemic racism, sexism, and white supremacy in our nation. Through the, the, the murder of George Floyd, through the shooting of Jacob Blake and other injustices, we've, we've had a discussion on our history. We've had a discussion on what's the best way to move forward. And people are able to acknowledge, at least a lot of people at some level, that we have some really serious problems domestically. Well, if we have this much white supremacy, systemic white supremacy, systemic racism in our foundations, and we see the fruit of that domestically, can you just imagine how jacked up our relationships must be internationally? Right? We just, just a few months ago, six weeks ago, we passed the 75th anniversary 
of the dropping of the nuclear bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. There was hardly a word about it here in the US. Japan held several memorials. In, in, when you look at McNamara, who was actually working under General LeMay, he later went on to become the Secretary of Defense, but he was working under General LeMay as a statistician in the Pacific Theater. And he was doing the stats on the bombing rate going out over the Pacific Islands, like Japan. And these were some of the stats that helped plan the bombing raids. And even before we dropped nuclear bombs, we had massive bombing raids against the, the country of Japan. In fact, the, the most deadly of all the bombing raids wasn't even nuclear. It was Operation Meeting House, which was the incendiary bombing of Tokyo. It was more deadly than, than um, Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Over 100,000 civilians were killed in that single night of bombing. And that wasn't even nuclear. And in his documentary, The Fog of War, McNamara recalled a conversation he had with General LeMay. And LeMay said, if we lose this war, we will be tried as war criminals. And McNamara acknowledged, agreed. He said he was right because we were behaving as war criminals. Now we didn't lose the war. And so McNamara was honored with his service with an award. He was later called to be secretary of defense. He went on to basically be the architect of the Vietnam War, including the use of Agent Orange. Went on to be a celebrated war hero, leader of our nation. Even though he acknowledged himself, he was a war criminal. So this is the problem we have is we've been, it, we have, yes, we have massive problems with systemic racism sexism and white supremacy that's embedded deep within our nation and we see the fruit of it everywhere we go. We haven't even begun to look at how that systemic racism, sexism and white supremacy has impacted our global and international relationships. One of the nominations I am most looking forward to making as president is I want to nominate a Native American as my Secretary of State. I talk a lot about the need to create what George Erasmus said was common memory. Creating common memory so that we can move forward with a healthier community. And if we, I would love to have not only a Native American myself as the president in the White House, but as our chief ambassador to the globe, I would love to have another Native person. Someone who has a very different memory of these lands before they were colonized. If you look at who our closest allies are, you look at our NATO allies, almost all of them are colonial nations. Mm -hmm. The UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, these nations colonize much of the world and they're our closest allies. Why? Because we share colonial values. And none of us, none of these nations have ever dealt with in a just way our history of colonialism. So just like I would love to have a, a deep dialogue, a national dialogue on race, gender, and class here in the US, I would love to have a very in-depth dialogue with the leaders of our allies about what are the values that actually hold us together? What do we need to begin to acknowledge and what changes do we need to make so that we all can be better citizens of a global community? And I would argue right now, much of Western Europe and the US are not healthy citizens of a global community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, something that a lot of you know, people leftists in particular have been grappling with is uh, this sense that in November, they aren't happy with uh, their choice in Joe Biden, but they do feel that Donald Trump is in some ways a unique evil. And of course, the Democrats and the media have really been uh, pushing that narrative that, you know, Trump is different than your average, uh, you know, Republican or your average 
Democrat or your average any president. He simply represents a threat not only um, to marginalized communities, but also to you know democracy, whatever semblance of democracy is left in this country. Uh, do you think there's any grain of truth to the fact that Trump is a unique evil? And what do you say to voters that are going to cast their vote on that basis this November? Trump is absolutely a problem. He's a unique problem. He's, he's explicit with his racism, his sexism, and the white supremacy in a way that our nation hasn't seen maybe since Abraham Lincoln. But he's not the root of the problem. And simply removing him from office is not going to solve our nation's problems. I gave a TEDx talk about in late 2018, 2018, called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. In that TEDx talk, I go through how the doctrine of discovery has been embedded into Supreme Court case precedents, basically saying because natives are savages, we're only occupants of the land, and white people who are fully human have the right of discovery to the land, so therefore they're the two title holders. That doctrine of discovery gets referenced by the Supreme Court as recently as 2005. One of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions I've read in my lifetime, except for maybe the McGirt one just a few weeks ago. And that opinion in 2005 was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Why? Well, because when your land titles are based on the understanding legally that natives are savages, this makes white supremacy a bipartisan value. I wrote an op-ed during the impeachment hearings, and I said, if you think removing Donald Trump from office, impeaching Donald Trump is the solution, then you obviously don't understand the problem. I talk a lot about how when you have a house that's built on bad foundations, you're gonna get cracks in your walls, you're gonna get gaps in your windowsills, you're gonna get a crooked, creaky floor. Now you can argue about what color paint to put on the walls, what kind of caulking to use in your windows, what kind of carpet to put on the floor, but until you change your foundations, you're not gonna solve the problem. Now people have come back and said, yeah, but the house is falling down. Trump is causing the house to fall down, so we have to fix the house first. Well, it's never convenient to fix your foundations, never. But probably one of the least inconvenient times to fix your foundations is when the house is already falling down, right? What's the point of, of remodeling your kitchen when the piping and the foundation beneath that kitchen is crumbling and causing it to collapse? There's no point in remodeling it. Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, Mark, for people who want to, you know, start from the base and uh, help you with this mission that you're on and have been, you know, inspired by, you know, the perspective that you've shared with us today, uh, is there anywhere that they can go to, to support you in, in your campaign and, and your yeah. efforts for the presidency? Yeah, they can go to our website, which is markcharles2020.com. Uh, they can sign up to volunteer with us. They can sign up to be an elector for us on our ballot access pages. They can donate to our campaign. They can get our newsletters um, and they can connect with us on social media. We have, we're very active on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And so we have a lot of, a lot of energy going out through our social media. And um, we encourage people to connect with us as best they can. And, you know, we have eight weeks left. We have about eight weeks left until the November 3rd election. And uh, we are pushing forward with everything we have to make every change we can in this election. When I, I constantly, we released our, I entered the race in May of 2019. And I released a nine minute announcement video. It's on our website. Today, to this day, that video is our best campaign tool. I get emails from people regularly. Just last week, I'm in tears. I just found your video and I'm in tears. I've never felt such hope for our country before politically. Your, your, your vision gives us hope. We have one of the most divisive candidates in Donald Trump running for the Republican Party. And we have one of the least inspiring candidates in Joe Biden running for the Democratic Party. And when you compare our campaign and our vision to build a nation 
if Donald Trump wants to make America great again and Joe Biden wants to reclaim the soul of America, they both want to go back to some point in the past. Our campaign is trying to do something we've never done before as a nation. We are trying for the very first time to build a nation where we the people truly means all the people. And people shouldn't be surprised that we're a writing candidate. This kind of systemic change never comes from the center. You rarely get systemic change by checking a box. If you want systemic change, you almost always have to write that in. That kind of change always, always, always comes from the margins. And that's what we're doing. That's what this campaign's about. And I'm convinced if, if we can break through the media blackout of our campaign, if we can get people to hear about what we're doing, our vision and our goals of what we want to do for this nation stand a head and shoulders above both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, even put together. Absolutely. Um, Mark Charles, uh, we wish you the very best of luck in your campaign. And uh, we, uh, we definitely look forward to seeing what the future holds for you. Thank you very much. It was fun to be on the show with you. I hope you have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. It was great chatting with you.